Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Journey with me as I go down various rabbit holes to explore the best Plan B options for you. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. Welcome to the rabbit hole on the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones. And throughout my journey in finding a Plan B, I've gone down numerous rabbit holes to figure out which ones work for me. And since I've done some of this research already, I only think it's right to bring that information to fellow healthcare professionals to help aid in your own search. And as always, it's important for you, the listener, to do your own research and form your own opinions. Everyone's situation is unique, and a plan B that works for one CRNA doesn't always work for another. Self-awareness is the key in any decision you make, since you must have an accurate grasp of your own strengths, weaknesses, and goals. Today's topic is a continuation of our last rabbit hole episode, so make sure you check that one out first. Our rabbit hole of the day is, dun dun dun, craft brewing. Part two. In our last episode, I detailed the history of craft brewing and the different ways that you can actually get into this space. That included nano breweries, microbreweries, brew pubs, tap rooms, and bars. Today's show is going to focus on the actual steps that are necessary to take action, as well as pros and cons of entering into the space. But I realized after recording the first show that I neglected to mention one particular niche that has popped up in a lot of cities. That's the gastropub. This is the newest iteration of the tried and true public house and tavern. Pubs began to realize that if people would come to a brewery for a unique beer experience, they might also enjoy pairing it with a unique food experience. This trend began in the 1980s and 90s as foodie culture began to make waves in Europe. The first self-declared gastropub was The Eagle, which opened in London in 1991. Instead of the normal fried foods and mediocre service experience that some pubs are known for, they dared to combine innovative food with quality brews. This kicked off the gastropub movement in England and Europe, but it didn't hit the U.S. until the opening of the Spotted Pig in New York City's West Village in 2004. The trend has continued to this day, and you can now find a gastropub in nearly any metropolitan area. Keep in mind, though, that often these establishments serve cocktails and wine as well, and they don't necessarily brew or create their own beers, wines, and spirits, which means they may actually be cheaper to get off the ground. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get to work, shall we? What are the steps you need to take to begin your successful craft brewing journey? There are 10 steps that I'm going to list, and, and I'm going to list them in a stepwise fashion, but I want you to keep in mind that many of these steps may take place simultaneously or outside of the order that I've placed them in, simply because everyone's experience is different. Now, number one, write a brewery business plan. I cannot overstate enough how important this step is. This is your roadmap, your guide through the process of opening your business from concept to reality. You should include detailed information on your brewery concept, market research, business structure, key players and team members, and financial blueprints. There are literally dozens of places out there for you to go to find help for this, and your local community college or university may even have business startup classes that help you to write one. What did I do? Well, I googled brew pub business plan and happened to come across a plan that someone else had written for a business school project. Of course, I changed everything that I needed to in order to suit our needs, but it gave me a fantastic starting off point. And keep in mind that your business plan is actually a living document, which means that it is subject to change over time. I can't tell you how many iterations we went through. And as we went through these different concepts as a team 
and the brewing environment changed, I regularly altered the business plan to reflect that. Number two, choose a brewery concept. This is the thing that defines your brewery. If you have any kind of a marketing mind, you'll notice that some brewery concepts are just better than others. They stick out better. They catch the eye and they maintain consistency across their brand. And that's because your concept should influence everything that you do from a marketing and advertising standpoint. To do this, you'll need to choose a name, identify your brand, and determine the type of brewery that you want to operate. So first, you should choose a name for your brewery. This may seem easy until you actually begin to get into it and think about it. And then you start brainstorming. And then you start overthinking. We explored names like the Heavy Bomber Brewery, which was a nod to the artwork on the sides of bomber planes, planes in World War II. We looked at Gits and Shiggles, Longleaf Brewing, Mad Dash Brewing, because we were in Winston-Salem, you know, the Dash. And that one would have a more athletic theme to it. But overall, a good name must be a few things. It must be original. So make sure it's not already taken or too similar to another brewery's name. We actually had lawyers that helped us who specialized in breweries, and they conducted a search to help us secure our own trademark whenever we were ready. It should also be memorable. You'll want something that's easy to spell and pronounce that rolls off the tongue or is fun to say. You'll want something that's reflective, which means that the name you choose should reflect your company. You can create a list of what distinguishes your brand from others and go from there. There's a brewery in Winston-Salem that is called Small Batch Brewing. And guess what they do? They began with a one-barrel system, and they brewed in small batches. Now, I said to myself at the time, how in the world are they ever going to make enough beer to sell to make a profit? Yet, here they are nine years later, while I never even got off the ground. There's probably a lesson in there somewhere. But finally, you want your name to be broad. And no, I don't mean it should be named after a woman. I mean that your name should lend itself to a variety of opportunities, products, and themes. Don't be too specific, or you may pigeonhole yourself into too tight of a space. Now, next, you should identify your brand. This is how you connect with customers. Identify target markets and determine the direction of your business. Start by listing your company values. This should help you to discover your target audience and find the emotional drivers behind your products. But this isn't enough. I mentioned before that not enough breweries are continuous with their branding. So I've attached an article in the show notes that goes into this a bit more, but there are so many different ways that you can go about it. And one of the best examples I've found is Revolution Brewing out of Chicago. They are heavy on military and some steampunk vibes, and they have a template for their can designs with two color variations leading into horizontal lines into the core graphic concept on each can, which means they can launch new beer types while keeping their recognizable design overall. But the coolest thing that they do, anytime you find their beer on tap, you will find their iconic fist handle, a callback to the revolution theme and easy to notice at a bar or tap house. And finally, you should choose your brewery type. I went over those more in detail in part one, so I'm not going to do that here. But whether you go with a nanobrewery, a microbrewery, a brew pub, tap room, bar, or gastropub, the world is literally your oyster. Another intriguing option is to work with an established brewery on a contract basis. As the hiring company, you retain the responsibility of marketing and distributing the beer, while the company you've hired is responsible for production and packaging. Any decision you make is based on our next step, though, which is number three. Determine the cost of starting your brewery. This is the kicker. I mean, the cost can vary quite a bit depending on several factors. What kind of brewing system do you need? That can cost as little as $100,000 or less if you buy used, or upwards of $1 million for a brand new 30-barrel all-bells-and-whistle system. There are plenty of reasonable options out there, though. So how much beer will you produce at how much per batch? My old estimates were $900 per 10-barrel batch and $1,350 per 15-barrel batch, but those are probably outdated by now. Will you need a kitchen to serve food as well as hosts and wait staff, or will you just need bartenders? What's the cost of the furniture that you need to outfit your location? And speaking of that, what's your rent or mortgage payment on the property? 
Retail rent can cost between $10 a square foot to $30 a square foot per year. All in all, the cost of opening your own brewery will likely fall between $500,000 to $1.5 million based on your location, needs, preferences, and starting point. Now, on to number four, securing your funding. This is a challenging hurdle, but you can do it if you keep an open mind. You may have money saved up, but that's likely not going to be enough. There are different options, though, in addition to your own self-funding that you can use. You can look for investors who have a piece of equity in the business or are getting certain returns. You can search for loans, whether that's through traditional banks, small business loans, equipment loans, or hard money lenders. And don't forget about crowdfunding. Kickstarter and GoFundMe are just a couple of different ways to go about it. And while they can be kind of hit and miss, it really all depends on how you sell it. These sites are also a marketing tool and can be used to build excitement around your grand opening. Now, number five, applying for licenses and permits. You're selling alcohol, so you'll need some type of a liquor license. In North Carolina, they offer limited licenses that allow you to sell beer and wine, and full licenses, which are more expensive and more of a hassle to get, but they include the ability to sell liquor as well. Now, these costs vary wildly from state to state. I mean, we're talking a few thousand dollars to several hundred thousand dollars. In the South, you also have dry counties to worry about, and, and even in some places in the Midwest. And in some states like Pennsylvania, there are only a set amount of liquor licenses in circulation, meaning you'll have to apply for a transfer or pay higher costs in order to acquire one. If you're running a kitchen, you'll also need restaurant licenses and permits too. Hopefully this cost should stay around $1,000 or less, but again, states do like their money, so do your due diligence ahead of time. You'll also need to build the proper time into your business plan to get these permits since it can take several months to finally get a hold of the ones you need. Research your state and ask some local breweries and restaurateurs the kinds of snags that they've run into to help you avoid those problems. Now, number six, choose your location. Like all these steps, this one is pretty important. There are so many factors to consider. Traffic patterns and visibility, parking and accessibility storage space, local zoning and regulations, safety of the building. All of these factors play a role. And because we wanted a brew pub with space for a restaurant and a 10-barrel brewery, we needed a minimum of 6,000 square feet with an ideal of 10,000 square feet. Now, obviously, a simpler brewing operation, tap house, or bar can have much smaller spaces, so you'll just have to figure out which one is right for you. Now, on to number seven buying your brewing equipment. There's a lot more to this than it may seem like at the start. Yes, you'll need your basic brewing equipment, fermenters, boiling equipment, and brew kettles. And you can find those systems online pretty easily, but there are a lot more things to think about. How are you going to serve your beer? If you're using basic bar draft systems, you'll need keg tapping, dispensing, and serving equipment, along with different sizes and types of beer glasses to match with the brews that you choose to make. And this means tap towers and handles, as well as line cooling for your drafts. And if you're planning to lug those kegs around with your brute strength, I mean, that's probably not the best idea, right? So get some hand trucks, drum handling equipment, and get some keg racks to improve your storage capacity and overall safety. If you're planning to bottle, then you'll need to consider bottling and packaging supplies. This may mean growler fillers, labels, and beverage shippers, to more advanced types of bottling line equipment. Oh yeah, and you'll probably need some refrigeration to keep those brews nice and cold. So look into countertop bottle coolers and walk-in refrigerators. And last but not least, you'll need a variety of ingredients and flavorings to actually create and customize your beers. That could be honey, bitters, wood chips, liquid malt extract, and numerous others in addition to your standard malt, barley, and hops. Now, on to number eight, create your draft list, and menu if needed. The draft list that you create should be catering to two things, what your customers want and what you actually want to brew. When you put your passion into your brewing, the customers take notice. And similarly, when you find a particular niche that needs filling in your area, customers appreciate that too. Our goal was to have rotating beers, but to have a good mix in general. There's nothing more frustrating than walking into a brewery to find out that they only make IPAs and you don't like IPAs, or 
maybe one that serves only dark beers, and you really prefer light ones. Our focus was on ales, since you don't actually need to refrigerate them for the yeast to work during fermentation like you do with lagers. But we wanted to have a pale ale, an amber ale, an IPA or two, a stout, and a wheat ale like a Hefeweizen. And then, of course, there are seasonal brews like strawberry, honey, or pumpkin ales, in addition to some more experimental stuff with different styles, flavors, and alcohol levels. But beer should be fun, and there is something out there for everyone. If you do elect to have a restaurant component, you'll want to figure out your food menu as well. Of course, people typically think of bar food when they think of beer, so nachos, wings, appetizers, burgers, and all that stuff. I mean, they work, but you, you shouldn't be afraid to look outside of the box too. Beer can pair with a lot of different foods, and those foods can be quite exquisite. The best example I've found is Brewery Bavana. It's located in Raleigh, and they take a sophisticated approach to their brewing service, and they provide high-class Asian-inspired fare. Now, number nine, market and advertise your brewery. This is a super big step, and it can be done during many other parts of the process to help you build excitement for your grand opening. In general, you should probably budget between 1% to 2% of your annual revenue on marketing. Now, I mentioned earlier that you could use your Kickstarter campaign to build excitement, but that's not all you can do. I mean, once you've secured funding and a building and you're actually in that construction phase, now's the time to start documenting your progress for social media engagement. Posting videos of construction and equipment placement gets potential customers excited about what is to come. And this is generally free to low cost advertising, and it can help you build that engaged customer base. Now, there are plenty of ways to advertise that are much more traditional in nature. Print advertising, billboards and signage, and radio and TV commercials, to name a few. But these can end up costing you significantly if you're not careful, and they may not even reach your desired audience. Being intentional about your marketing and advertising plan can save you a lot of headache and lead to better results overall. Now, most businesses include merchandising in this bucket as well. You may have t-shirts, hats, stickers, bottle openers, koozies, the list goes on, and you can get as creative with it as you like. Sure, you can make a modest amount from merchandise sales eventually, but most of the time, these products are actually being used as giveaways at events like beer festivals, which are another great advertising opportunity, and other local events like music and art festivals, races, and charity events. These help get your name out into the community, and they create brand recognition that pays off later on. Now, finally, number 10, host a soft opening. The equipment is in place. All that's left is the grand opening. However, before you open your doors to everyone, you may want to consider a soft opening with family, friends, and donors. The reasoning for this is pretty simple. Sometimes there are hiccups when you first get open. So a soft opening can help you to identify some of those troublesome areas prior to opening to the general public. It also makes those who are able to come to the soft opening feel like they're attending a more exclusive event, thus creating a stronger customer connection. And those who aren't invited will want to make sure that they are invited to the next exclusive event that you host. And that's it. That's what you need to do in order to get your own brewery or brew pub up and going. Of course, these steps can be loosely applied to any type of brewery, beer, or restaurant venture, but I do hope that this actually helps you out. And so now, without further ado, I think it's time to get on to our pros and cons. First, a pro. This is a pretty simple business model. You brew beer, and you sell it to other people for profit. That's the game. The more you sell, the more money you stand to make. Next is our first con, competition. The space is kind of starting to get crowded out there. That doesn't mean that your particular area may not have more room for a brewery, but differentiating yourself from the crowd becomes difficult with so many competitors out there. Next is a pro, high margins. The gross margin for a brewery is around 40%, which is much higher than other businesses. And you should be able to manage your costs fairly easily once you get going. Next is a con, the learning curve. Brewing beer isn't necessarily simple, and it takes practice and trial and error to find the right mix. If you don't brew beer yourself, you'd better find someone for your team with the necessary experience. 
Next is a pro slash con. That's the cost. Yes, it is possible to get started on a shoestring budget if you're willing to take the long way around. Maybe you invest in a one barrel system off the bat in your garage and test recipes on your friends. But more than likely, you should plan for several hundreds of thousands of dollars, of which you'll need to put down a significant portion for financing. Next is a pro, scalability and flexibility. Beer is generally always in demand, but it's up to you to meet that demand. With the proper size system, you can scale up or down to meet the needs of your customers and your own financial burden. As I've said before, a 10 to 15 barrel system should set you up nicely for success because you can do either a couple of batches per week or a couple of batches per day, and that allows you to meet a very wide range of demand. Next is a con. Businesses, benefits, and taxes. Yes, this is a business, which means you're going to have to be in charge of self-employment taxes, hiring employees, and any benefits that you plan to offer. And that stuff can honestly be downright dizzying to think about and manage. Next is a pro, creativity. Brewing is a labor of love for most of those who get into it, and it can be really enjoyable to put your creativity out in the world for others to enjoy. And finally, our last con, time. This is not a business where you just show up when you want to, unless you have everyone else doing the work, which isn't likely. So this business takes time and effort to get off the ground and to get running. And a lot of times it's rewarding, but a lot of times it's a real sacrifice. So it just depends on how enjoyable you actually find the whole process. Now, as always, you can find a ton of links in the show notes, but I'd also suggest that you check out the following books. First one is Brewing Up a Business by Sam Calision, and I think I got that right, but I might not have. But for those of you who don't know, Sam is the founder of Dogfish Head Craft Brewery, and he has some great insights through his own experiences. This is an older book. It's over a decade old, but I find it to still have some great nuggets throughout. Next is How to Start a Microbrewery. Be Your Own Boss, Make Good Money, and Craft Beer That You and Others Love by Cole Ferguson. He goes over the ins and outs of creating a business plan, raising capital, and common mistakes to avoid in the process of building your own business. And next is the Microbrewery Handbook, Craft, Brew, and Build Your Own Microbrewery Success by D.C. Reeves. This one focuses on the branding and creating a unique and memorable experience for your customers, as well as the financial aspects of building your own microbrewery business. With all that said, that's going to do it for today's show. As always, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Plan B CRNA podcast. And if you found value today, make sure you hit subscribe and give us a five-star review. The show only grows because of you, so make sure you share it with a friend, family member, or colleague to help them on their own side income journey. And I also want to hear from you. If you have a question, comment, or rabbit hole topic that you'd like me to cover in an upcoming show, just pop it in your review of the podcast. I check those all the time, and I cover those questions in future episodes. If you'd like to know more about me and gain access to passive investment opportunities, make sure to find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, or visit my website at www.oncallinvestments.com. This is Bobby Jones signing off. Till next time, stay safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.